On this Trinity Sunday, I have to tell you a classic story about St. Augustine. One day he was walking along the seashore, contemplating, trying to figure out this doctrine of the Trinity. And he spotted a little boy who had dug a hole in the sand and had a pail, was going over to the ocean and dipping in the water and carrying the water back and pouring it into the hole in the sand, back and forth and back and forth. And Augustine said, little boy, what are you doing? And he said, I'm going to put the whole ocean in this hole I just dug. And St. Augustine said, that's impossible. And the little boy said, I will sooner get the whole ocean in this hole then you will completely understand the Trinity. It's a mystery. Bishop Sheen, years ago, had given a lecture one evening on the subject of the Trinity. And after the lecture, a woman came up to him and said, thank you, Bishop Sheen, for your brilliant talk. Now I completely understand the Trinity. And Bishop Sheen, in his own way, smiled and said, Madam, if you think after listening to me in one evening that you totally understand the doctrine of the Trinity, you didn't understand one word I said tonight. It's a mystery that God let us in on. The Trinity means one God, one God in three distinct divine persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. God is without beginning. God is without end. God always is. The Trinity, the glimpse that we have, has God the Father loving God the Son, and God the Son loving God the Father, and their love is so dynamic and so personal that their love himself is a person, the Holy Spirit. One God, three persons. As the Catechism of the Catholic Church tells us the doctrine of the Trinity is the center of our Christian faith and our Christian life. And while God has left evidence of the Trinity among us, we never would have figured it out had Jesus not told us. That's how we know. But God has left evidence of the Trinity. You and I have been created in the image and likeness of God. So we are Trinitarian in our makeup. When we look very carefully, we won't understand the whole doctrine, but we will see evidence of it. And one of the places that we look for evidence of the Trinity is in Christian marriage. We celebrate today the 50th wedding anniversary of Rich and Mary Novotny. You've given me good material to work with today. On Trinity Sunday, on Father's Day. You see, Christian marriage is God's idea. The lifelong union of a man and a woman it's not simply a civil or political construct that we're free to redefine. Christian marriage is a gift from God to our world. And what is the evidence of the Trinity in Christian marriage? This, a husband, a wife, a man, a woman, love each other completely, totally, 
They love each other. And their love for each other sometimes results in the creation of another life through the agency of God, the conception of a child. A child is evidence of the personal, total, self-giving self and receiving love of a married couple. The two and another life in conception become three, like the Trinity. God the Father loves God the Son. God the Son loves God the Father so much and so totally that their love is himself a person the Holy Spirit. In Christian marriage, we see evidence of the Trinity. Now, this is also Father's Day. We're talking about a vocation, a calling. We center today on the calling to fatherhood. But we all have a calling from God a vocation. And sometimes when we look at our callings, we can think, Lord, why did you choose me? <laughs> Other people could do far better than what I do. Why did you choose me? But God did, and God does. And we take the strengths we've been given, we also take the weaknesses that we have, and we put them in the Lord's hands and we rely upon his grace. I came across a bit of writing on that subject of, why did you choose me, God? <laughs> why didn't you choose somebody else? And this writer says, don't worry, because Moses stuttered, and David's armor didn't quite fit. John Mark was rejected by St. Paul. And the prophet Hosea's wife, well, she was a prostitute, but God chose them. The prophet Amos's only training was in the school of fig tree pruning. Solomon was too rich. Abraham, he was too old. David was too young. And Timothy, he had ulcers. But God chose them. Peter was afraid of death, and Lazarus was dead. John was self-righteous. Naomi was a widow. Paul was a murderer, and by the way, so was Moses. Jonah ran away from God, and Miriam, she was a gossip, and yet God chose them. Gideon and Thomas both doubted. Jeremiah was depressed and suicidal. Elijah was burned out. John the Baptist was a loudmouth. Martha was a worrywart. Mary was lazy. And Samson, he had long hair. And God chose them. Did I mention that Moses had a short fuse? So did Peter and Paul and a host of others. God doesn't require a job interview. God doesn't hire and fire like most bosses because with God, he's more our dad than he is our boss. With all of our weaknesses, God has chosen us. We put everything, our strengths and our weaknesses, in the hands of the Lord, and we rely upon his grace. He's given us a calling. He's given us a vocation. God has chosen us. This Father's Day gives us an opportunity to do a little self-examination. If we're looking at what it takes to be a good father, by and large, we're not going to find it in our culture, which has gotten so broad. We have to ask what the Lord expects of parenthood. What does he expect? What do I need to improve upon? 
What is he asking of me? In fatherhood, the Lord is not simply asking that we correct our children. That's part of it. But we need to spend even more time forming them as Christian men and Christian women, encouraging them and building them up. Another writer by the name of Corey Buss, B-U-S-S-E, wrote something called 10 Ways to Be a Great Catholic Dad. And I'll place them before you. One, keep holy the Lord's Day. Do our children know that Sunday Mass is the center of our lives? Two, teach your children faith. Do they not only hear us talk about the faith, but also see us model prayerful and confident trust in our God? Three, don't forget forgiveness. Forgiveness is at the heart of Christianity. Do we practice it? and model for our kids the importance of the sacrament of reconciliation, confession. Four, give and let give. Do we teach and show them the importance of generosity and service? You'll like this one. I like this one. Five, play and have fun. Joy is the hallmark of a Christian. Do our kids see that in us? Six, get caught praying. Without daily prayer and conversation with God, we're dead. Do our kids see us pray? And do we initiate family prayer? Seven, be Mr. Doesn't Know It All. Do we foster an attitude of curiosity and the search for truth? Eight, might for right. Do we model integrity? Nine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Do we help our kids find their talents and do we encourage them to develop them? And 10, Tradition. Do we take our Catholic identity seriously and pass on to our children important rituals and the language of our faith? If we were to add to that list, we might likely include how do you model your faith by the way that you treat your spouse? Do your children see patience and love and forgiveness and service and initiation? On this Trinity Sunday, on this Father's Day, on this 50th wedding anniversary of Mary and Rich Novotny, I leave with you the advice of St. Paul in today's second reading. Paul says to all of us, brothers and sisters, rejoice. Mend your ways. Encourage each other. Agree with each other. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit will be with you.